you know, which is 60 miles um, outside Los Angeles. Um, two people walked in with a gun and, and shot, shot up a holiday party. Um, if, uh, at the end of the day, 14 people were killed and about 20 people injured. It was the largest terrorist attack since 9-11. Um, unfortunately, the uh, out, out, outlets like the Los Angeles Times um, have been too um, schooled in, in covering such attacks. Um, as you guys know, uh, we, have, we, we, we have a lot of mass shootings in the United States. That year, according to the, the Washington Post, did a tabulation, and they, I think there was like 355 mass shootings, and they set a, a, a base of, uh, you know, when it, I think four or more people were, were shot. So um, we, had to, we had to respond, and we had to um, respond very quickly because you know, driving 60 miles in Los Angeles, as you guys know, is a, is a feat by itself. So what we did, um, there's something at the LA Times, uh, John Danishevsky is here and Simon is back there, so they will be familiar with this term. We, in Los Angeles, at the LA Times, you have something called the swarm, where you just flood the zone with reporters and photographers. So we, we had folks who live in what we call the Inland Empire, which is San Bernardino. So we sent 12 reporters and nine photographers to the scene because we, we knew it was gonna be big. And, um, after, in a very short time, we, we became the source for everything about the shooting. So much so that um, shortly after the San Bernardino Fire Department, they were getting a lot of um, re requests for comment on what was going on. And they posted a note on their website that says, you know, for, for um, information about the shooting, please go to latimes.com. Um, and, you know, while we were competing against social media, media, we were not because we had a bunch of professional journalists on the ground who were telling, sto telling the story in real time. You know, not, not telling rumor or innuendo or, you know, repeating what social media. The mere fact that we had so many journalists on the ground um, with the, uh, interviewing f folks, um, giving real, inform real updates. On the first day, we had um, we, we, uh, we, we've invented something in the newsroom call, uh, for live reporting um, called the live blog. And on the first day, we had 149 pieces of content on the live blog, which is graphics and, um, s uh, graphics and photos and uh, you know, news updates. So uh, it, it all had, I mean, uh, this, this success, if you want to call it that, of our coverage, had to do with the fact that you had professional journalists who knew how to report. Yeah, but, but Elmar mentioned that live reporting can also be um, dangerous. <coughs> yeah, but, um, well, you know, I, I hear that, but... Is, is there a filter somewhere, or...? Um of course, and you use the normal, normal filters, right, mm. that you do it in journalism, but at, at the end of the day, we are in the business of publishing, and when you have an attack like this, you know, the public uh, readers want to know what happened, how it happened. And we are, we are merely f uh, fulfilling our role and telling the story without, you know, the, the attack has already killed. Um, the, you know, the story was already pretty much done on the first day. But uh, in, in an attack like this, what I want also wanted to say um, that we also had to use our global network to, to get, to provide the context of the story. So we had reporters in Pakistan where the attackers had links to, and Saudi Arabia, where one of the attackers um, studied to try to provide the, the context of the story. So this, it's quality reporting. Yes. You have to take... Oh, you, you've yeah, got yeah only one it's, it's very, very important that we add to the live coverage, which I don't think is bad. We just have to obey by the rules. We cannot forget the journalistic rules in all of a sudden going on live. And, and it, it remains true what CNN once coined, I believe, be first, but first be right. And therefore, you have to find uh, reporters in other areas which can give expertise or their own reporting to add to the story. You have to find experts 
to weigh in as well. Uh, you have to cross-reference with uh, what is available, maybe in data systems on, on attacks like these and so on. So really give it context. I believe that even if you go on live and you stay on live for an hour or two or three, it is possible to do the reporting in the way that doesn't create panic, but helps people to understand. I think it is possible. What about what about yeah, the I wanted yeah. to say, not about the newspaper, but Le Monde, like for five or six years, we have started to open for every big event a live with the audience. And we can see, with, especially with terrorism, like blog, yeah, it's like kind of a blog, and mm. uh, you have, uh, you know, the, the feed, and uh, people can uh, put questions, interact. You choose, of course, what you will put uh, in the feed. And it's really impressive to see how many people will come in time of uh, an event, like a terror attack, to participate. And uh, of course, the staff, I, I'm, I'm not part of the live uh, blog, so I can praise their work. And uh, the staff is really cautious not to publish information that were not verified. And for the people, we can see that they are really um, in demand to have this uh, professionalism, to come with the rumors they get on the social networks and say, look, they are saying that, and to have some professional telling them it's not verified. For the moment, just keep it away. I would like to add here that it would be a bit of a mistake to treat the terrorism story like any other. I mean, obviously, our first commitment is to my readers, to the viewers, to the public. They have a right to know, and it is our job to let them know. But we have in the present world this terrorist group whose, as somebody said, publicity is their oxygen. In fact, they do it so that it is publicized. And because they want publicity, they do it more viciously. Each act is followed by a more vicious act because that will give them more publicity. So I am fully cognizant of the fact that we have a right to inform and it is our duty to inform, but it would be a mistake to handle this story like any other. IPI Vienna sent us an article published by The Guardian about a German researcher, Michael Yetter, professor in Colombia, who analyzed more than 60,000 terrorist attacks between 1970 and 2012, and his conclusion <coughs> is that media attention actively encourages terrorist attacks. Um, if you allow, I can quote, quote the art article. According to Yetter, one, one additional New York Times article, and he, New York Times is only one example, about an attack in a particular country increased the number of ensuing attacks in the same country by between 11 percent and 15 percent. On average, he calculates, um, it's a strange calculation, but he calculates that an additional um, article appears to result in between one and two casualties from another terrorist attack within the next week. Um, I, I'm not in the position to, um, to evaluate the scientific approach, but how do you react as journalists? Of course, I also Web cannot, cannot, uh, cannot evaluate that, but he is insinuating by, by that that if we won't report, then terrorism would go away. This is plain stupid because terrorism has been around as long as people, there are people somewhere who feel that they are treated unjustly, that there is injustice around the world. That's the basic narrative and storyline that terrorists are using to uh, basically legitimate their fight because they say it's not a fight, uh, it's not terrorism, it's a fight for justice. And therefore, we have to look at what the reasons behind terrorism are, uh, as well as looking at what the results of it are, and who the people are who do that, actually. Only if we do that, if we go into the depth in, in the reporting, we can show what are, what are the other ways to actually deal with terrorism. Uh, and I, as I said, I cannot evaluate this, but I doubt it. I really doubt it that because we are in times now where even if we don't report, we leave um, the, the terror to be spread through social media in raw, without any contents and, and evaluation. Yeah, we, we forgot a lot, like if we take the example of Middle East uh, 
terrorism or even uh, in France, uh, the, the people who join, we for forget the political and social uh, explanation for this. Like in Middle East, in Iraq or Syria, even the regime, like he say, uh, Mr. Said, they try to, I mean, hide some elements. And what they hide for uh, especially is that there was the Arab Spring and there, re there is some uh, social and poli political discontent. And terrorism is more fueled by this social and political discontent than by media. Media is just a vehicle to promote it. But the basis is there, like the political discontent, the social reasons are there. And even if you don't report on the terror attacks, it will remain. I agree, but let's continue a little bit on the publicity effect, uh, Elmar. What about that um, attack to the, to the football team bus in Germany a few weeks ago? Maybe you'll have to explain a little bit to you. Yeah, what happened was what happened. that um, when they were on their way to the stadium, actually three bombs exploded right next to the bus and uh, at least one of the uh, soccer players got injured. Um, and everybody thought, or first, there was an indication that there might have been, this might have been an Islamist attacks, attack because a letter of, um, um, how do you call it? They, they were basically uh, claiming, claiming, a claim basically, um, uh, claimed that uh, they did it for, for, um, uh, from Islamist point of view. Uh, it turned out it was a guy who actually just wanted to make money with it uh, by betting on it on the, at the stock exchange, which was very... I had never heard of something like and he this. Found, he found the model for the letter in the, in the media. Yeah, he just Supposedly. downloaded it from the media. And, and So what we see here is that if we jump to conclusions uh, too fast, we might um, um, uh, create the opposite, what we want to do. So we really have to just focus on what we are. We are journalists. We have to do the reporting um, and really be careful in jumping to conclusions or speculating. Um, and I think that the Los Angeles Times, for example, what you were just describing is exactly what we have to do. We have to combine the immediate reporting on what is happening on the ground with uh, all the other layers that belong to journalistic work. I think you did a great job on that. So I, I just want to add to that, that not reporting on these things is, is really not an option. I mean, you, you have to do it in a, in a way that everything you publish is verified. Yeah. And um, it's, of course, truthful and it's deep. So what, uh, in, in addition to the um, breaking news we did, we went back and did, you know, deep um, stories about the attackers and where they came from, but also about the city and the victims, and to tell their stories. We invited, we invited the public there in San Bernardino to weigh in about with their their memories of the victims, and um, in that way, it, it humanized and it shows, it showed rather who the victims of these attacks were. And many of them were people who had left conflicts in their own lands, like in. In, in Iran and in um, Mexico and in Eritrea and you know and um, and the community really appreciate the fact that they were part of telling the story, but but not re not reporting it because of the various causes of these attacks from ISIS to lone wolf attacks to you know to political acts you know the, it's the responsibility on the press to just go and tell the stories. Mafuz, just imagine if you know in in to, to use your example if the press back in those days decided that, well, we are not going to cover, you know, because it's terrorism, you know, as, as defined by the establishment. So um, I think the cure for that is to have professional journalists who are schooled in, in, res in responsible ways of reporting and publishing to, do you know, tell those stories. Do your media take new precautions? Do you follow new protocols when reporting on terrorism today? I think, Alain, you, you told me about... Uh, uh, Le Monde stopping to publish pictures yeah. of the perpetrators. What was, was that? It was not only Le Monde, it was a great debate in France because as you know, since uh, Mohamed Merah in 2012, we had a series of attacks and uh, especially uh, November 2015 and then there was an uh, attack in Nice and then there was an uh, attack in uh, Saint-Etienne-du-Rouvray against uh, two priests. And 
it's starting like the debate starting to increase from uh, Charlie Hebdo, uh, Bataclan, and there were a lot of pressure from the audience not to publish the photos of the perpetrators. Like they were saying, it's insane. Uh, you show these people because you know medias also show photos of of them uh, from their Facebook page where you see them before committing the action in their normal life. And um, uh, we did as well a memorial for the victims, but even with uh, this, uh, you know, um, uh, these stories about the victims, the people couldn't stand the publication of the photos. So I think this pressure. So Le Monde did self uh, yes. censorship. So there was like. Did and, it work? And Le Monde was cautious because even for Nice perpetrators, the uh, photo editors decided not to publish the photos of his himself in his life before because they say it doesn't add to the story. But there was pressure and Le Monde decided that from saint Etienne du rouvray they will not publish any more photos of the perpetrators. And it was followed by BFM TV, uh, a lot of newspapers and uh, TV, radio. It was a great debate. Le Figaro, for instance, said, we are sorry, we won't do that. And finally, Le Monde just explained, like the director explained, like, a few days after, okay, it's not that we won't publish any photos anymore, but no photos of the perpetrator uh, from propaganda video or his uh, life before. So and I'd like to ask the panel, what do you think? What is your opinion on that? Is no, that a good I, strategy? Well, it is a difficult issue to handle. I mean, those who say that by giving it publicity, we are encouraging uh, terrorism, I think they are very wrong. But for us journalists to treat this story, okay, just do a good job, do a professional job, I think it's a little more complicated than that. We need to put our heads together because it is true that these people do these things, a lot of it for publicity. I mean, they are trying to hog the media attention. So how do we serve the public to the best of public interest and freedom of the press and yet not feed into these people's desire? It's not easy f uh, for us to do, but it is definitely something that we journalists need to think about. But but not publishing the photos, it's, it's against our instinct, <laughs> I, I'd say, no? No, but we had this think? discussion as well, and I agree with Mafuz that we cannot treat it as a regular story. Uh, we have to be, be aware that this is very, very sensitive, but in both ways. If we don't publish something, then there are people in our societies now who say, well, they're withholding the truth. So if 12 pe people die, 12 people die in Berlin, and we, you know, try to boil it down, then people will be there who say, well, this is a huge atrocity and an attack while they're no not reporting. And with regards to the names and the faces, we have that discussion and we said we cannot make a fundamental decision. We have to decide on a case-by-case -case basis because it can be important to show the face and say the name and tell the story because sometimes, if we don't, people might get the feeling it's the migrants or the foreigners or the Muslims. So some kind of anonymous group is committing those atrocities. Well, it's not. It's people who grew up in our societies and for some reason turn to those uh, acts and we have to explain why they do that. So we really should lay out why the, uh, the Kouachi brothers or Koulibaly or all the participants in the, in the Paris November atrocities why they did it, who they are, what their background is, how long they have been in prison. And I think we have to individualize the crime as opposed to make it a crime of just an unknown group or something like this. Okay, there's more questions, but I would like to ask Hélène because um, we see so many, we saw so many young um, people leaving Europe and go to Syria and Iraq as fighters. You think we don't have any part of responsibility, we as a media? It's difficult is to it say. Only, is it only the 98% uh, outside? Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, if, if you listen to experts, they will tell you there is a completely second world where we, mm. we have access. I mean, we can see, but these people are confined in this world and what 
what the media will do. I mean, we will publish, and maybe we helped at the beginning with, uh, while giving the propaganda, uh, diffusing the propaganda to, to publicize this information. But anyway, they get the information on the social media. The propaganda video, they find them on the, on the sh social media. There are forums. You know, they, the, these young people, they are more attracted through websites like videogames.com than Le Monde or BFM TV. It's the more, there was more questions from the audience. So, starting with you in the front. Yeah, I'm Anita. I'm uh, with The Week magazine, but I used to be with CNN before and uh, Time magazine. And I've been reporting from uh, the war fields in South Asia for 35 years on war and terrorism. So not reporting on terrorism is not an option. Our fundamental role is to inform, and we have to stay true to that. But my question is proportionality. Now, we were inundated with information about uh, the Los Angeles killings. We'd got nothing about what happened in Bangladesh, what Mahfouz just talked about. And this, I think, is another problem that the media, mainstream media, is not addressing. Why do we need round-the-clock coverage on CNN or BBC and all the other channels when there is a terror attack, when 14 people are killed in the United States, as against something <coughs> like what is happening in Bangladesh or in other parts of the world? So proportionality. Not covering is not the option, but should there be some kind of proportionality? Who wants to answer? Well, I, um, I'm not sure I can resolve that question, but um, I, I can say in Los Angeles, it's, you know, as Los Angeles Times, it was our duty to cover that since it was in our backyard or it was part of, in one of our communities. Um, I hear you on, on Bangladesh and, and the need to cover that. But, I mean, it's just a fact of um, that you don't have a lot of foreign press, for that matter, in Bangladesh. And um, you don't have, so basically, you don't have, you know, around-the-clock coverage like you would in Los Angeles or New York or some city where, where you have a, a foreign press. That's why I said I wouldn't be able to resolve that question. But do we report on it, and if, if, you know, whether it's the AP or... Uh, the LA Times, the New York Times, the CNN, yes, but maybe not, I agree, not, not with the same um, level of intensity. Uh, let us not forget, this is an issue, the proportionality issue. For example, the, the Buddhist, I mean, the atrocity going on in Rohingya at the moment, or earlier, uh, what happened to the Tamils in, in, in Sri Lanka. So there, and these are stories that, they were not events. They, they lasted for a long period, and yes, there was not the proportional coverage. And, and these are atrocities of the most severe kind that needs to be covered and the global conscience need to be, to be raised in this. I'm, I'm all for proportionality as well, but th there cannot be a number where we say, you know, if it's more than 200 who die, then we jump into the coverage. It depends on a whole variety of factors, as you know. The immediacy, for example, how relevant is it to people in Germany? And for people in Berlin, sorry, 12 people on the Christmas market in Berlin is a big deal. So uh, although it doesn't seem many in comparison to what happens every day around the world in the different parts. But with regards to proportionality, then we have to see where we should not have the specials, which have three-hour coverage or five-hour coverage, where we should just treat it as something that is in the regular newscast. And that's what we did with the recent attack in, in Paris um, on, on Champs-Élysées. Um, we also uh, kept the Stockholm incident uh, in, in the regular coverage. And of course, there is an argument to be made, we shouldn't have done that, but we did, although people died there. Um, so it's, it will be always a discussion. People who live here, who, who experience that, will say, we don't do enough. And people who, um, who think that, well, we have to get used to it. We have to build some kind of resilience. Sorry, if, sorry to come sorry. in again. Please, uh, <laughs> you know, to my colleague from India, I mean, if, if Indian newspapers or journalists do not know something about Bangladesh, a big event, you can't blame CNN 
or, or BBC. Okay, next question, please. Sorry, 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 but uh, we have more questions in the audience. Yes, I have a question. Uh, my name is Blanca Tapia. I work now for the uh, European Union for Fundamental Rights, but I was actually uh, one of the Spanish broad, uh, reporters covering the Madrid attack. I worked at that time for Televisión Española uh, when the Madrid bombings took place. And, um, and when you were thinking about that, and now I look at how it's being reported, I remember when that happened, uh, of course the Spanish press is used to, or was used to a lot of ETA attacks. So we know, and the way we reported about the terrorism is mainly based on, I'm here, I'm not getting close there, because, and I don't ask people to come close because ETA always had traps. So if you take a suitcase or a left uh, handbag, that was a trap for explosion, because that was the second trap. Get the people in, you leave a backpack, somebody comes helping, take the backpack, explodes, and then all the sanitary uh, is there. So that was the type of information that I always thought it was very important when reporting on terrorism. It's of course you have to report about it, but you have to give the reasons why, and what is interesting for the audience to know about that. And always with this angle of humanity, because for me, what was, I applaud the decision from Le Monde, but my question, and I would like to hear your opinion on that. For me, the human angle is so important because if you put on television the images of a policeman being killed directly on television, and if you happen to be the sister of that policeman, and this is when you find out your brother is being killed, I know this is going to be on social media, I know on social media, if my brother, I was wondering when I was reporting, if my brother was in one of those trains. And I didn't know. I could have gone on social media, well, at that time, in, uh, it wasn't that much. Look and see, are there photos of victims? Is my brother there? And then you go for that. But mm -hmm. to which extent media has the right to respect that human angle? And I think that's the aspect which, and I do believe that when big news like that terrorism happens, most people go to the main media for accuracy, for impartiality, for neutrality, and for truth. And I would like to know what you think about that. Thank you. Okay. And could you pass maybe the, the mic to the next um, question? It was in the back. Hi, Louis Sanders. We're, we're a bit running out of time, so. Excellent. Uh, Deutsche Welle. My question um, stems a little bit um, comes back from uh, breaking news and more into, for example, writing explainers or, for example, giving context to a situation. Um, for example, I had this case earlier this month I was writing about Europol um, and how they're increasing uh, their fight against terrorism in Europe. And uh, around this time, uh, the Islamic State published um, another issue of its English language uh, magazine in which it called um, for using trucks uh, to commit terrorist attacks, but also to um, invite people in as if they were renting an apartment and uh, kill them in that manner. So, sorry, the question, please? And, <laughs> and so my, my question is essentially, I mean, how far do you go into the details um, when doing public service journalism concerning, for example, terrorist organizations? Do you go into the details of, you know, when they publish this magazine, they call on threats, for example, um, you know, inviting people for like an apartment show and then killing them then, you know? D does that make sense? Hmm. Or? I, I think it's, it's a case by case basis and I don't think any responsible media will say, you know, just on, on its own without, without a, an incident, say, a Reason Magazine said go and, you know, this, go and bomb people with trucks. But if there's a terrorist attack and a truck was used and, and two weeks before, Reason Magazine said, you know, use tr truck bombs in public places. I think it's the responsible thing to do would, to, would be to add that for context without, without I mean, uh, uh, without uh, um, glorifying anything, um, yeah. but or, or without going too much into it because it's, it, that might be all you need to, to, ex to explain to readers uh, the cause of this attack. So, and you know, and coming back to the previous question um, about covering covering at attacks around the world, I mean, the the um, colleague here is right. You know, we co we probably reach two percent of the world's people, but with Facebook and Google and everything now, uh, an attack in Bangladesh 
can reach the entire world um, without having the entire Western press cover it. I know it's not the same thing, but that's just one thing to take in consideration. Yeah, just about the, the truck and the method, it's exactly what happened with Le Monde after the, the Nice attack. I mean, uh, we have someone following the, the social network of uh, Jihadi uh, uh, every day, and he never wrote an article about what are the methods that they, they proposed. But when we had an attack in Nice and a truck was used, we had, all, of course, an anger saying, okay, it was what of one of the weapons that they said in a previous uh, magazine that you should use. It's exactly how it worked. Uh, I, I didn't understand why the question about the showing the, the videos, but... Yeah. I think it, the difference is you didn't show the pictures of the perpetrators, but... Um, no, but th I there think were we some... all agree that we have to respect the But the, some media the were... Some media were, were, were broke to the higher authority of uh, uh, audiovisual in France, like BFM, because they showed the video, or they, uh, they say during the attack of uh, uh, Kouachi Brothers or Koulibaly that there were still some victims hidden in the, in the, the hypercacher yeah. supermarket. So there were so, some, um, some uh, complaints and uh, it was brought to the high authority, but that's for sure, it's something we have to be cautious, but it's different from publishing the photos of the perpetrators for me. Like, I don't agree with the policy of Le Monde, for instance. I think, as you said, it's important to understand who are these people, where they come from, because it's a new phenomenon that it comes from within, it comes from us, and we have to understand from where they come. Um, we had this discussion, and I think this question was very important because that's what I meant with the ethics. In Germany, we have a law, which is the first article of the Constitution. It says uh, the human dignity is the most important thing. So even if there is a victim, if somebody is dying due to a terrorism attack or suffering, we might be violating the person's human dignity by just showing the image. And uh, we also have a law, actually, that regulates public media in Germany, which says that we are not allowed to show the suffering of people unless, there is an unless, unless there is an overriding public interest in it. So you can weigh both things. Un you can say, unfortunately, but that's the way it is. So we didn't show the policeman uh, who was killed right in front of Charlie Hebdo. We blurred his face. Now you can say we shouldn't have shown the video, but we decided to show the video because it showed, unfortunately, how professional those two guys were and how cool or cold, ice cold they were, which showed that they had a military training in our opinion. But we blurred the victim to make sure that we respect the human dignity there. We and to the, yeah, to the other question, I just wanted to say, I think it's important to not focus only on events when something is happening. We have to focus on also the strategy papers. For example, the magazines that inspire or, uh, Dabik or Rumia and how they're called. And if there is something in there that they are asked to use trucks, there is, there's even advice in that magazine that says, don't choose the trucks that have the automatic braking system. Choose other trucks or find the overriding uh, switch. I think we should report on those things because then people are aware and politicians are aware that they should do something against it to protect. And last thing, we also have to report on the big strategy behind it. It's a 1,500 pages strategy paper from 2006 which laid out the entire thing that happened over the last 10 years with regards to Islamist terrorism. Um, and, and I think we should report on this because only if you understand where they come from, you can create the counter narrative and actually counter what the terrorists do. Uh, we've got zero minutes left. <laughs> so uh, I'll take the, last, the very last question and uh, please be short. Okay, a short practical point. Coming back to the basic thing of what happens when you have a terrorist inc incident, is there a case for accompanying it at that day with a brief reminder to the reader, online particularly, 
but a reader of newspapers, a brief analytical comment accompanying the coverage, which says, this is done for publicity. This is done for terrorism, explaining the thinking behind what's going on and reminding people that they're meant to build fear. They're meant to worry about what's happening. And also, engendering fear, warn people, of, not warn them, but just inform them of the risk factor. One person being shot in the middle of London is one person in eight or 10 million. Sorry, okay. Martin Huckabee from London, I should say. <laughs> but I think the, um, it needs to be done. It needs to be, the, the, the background to it needs to be explained briefly, yes. but prominently. That was a suggestion, and um, I think we, 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 we all agree. Uh, we think about it, and thanks a lot for joining us for this discussion. A very fruitful one, and um, thank you.